All right, people. Yes, I'm outside. It is simply too nice to not be outside. We have a Q&A on tap today. Okay, this is from Greg. Greg, great to see your name on here. Peace, Dan. I don't need another camera at all. Oh, I know where this is going. You already bought it, all right? You already bought it. But you've never had any real-time shooting, uh, blah, 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 but have never had any real-time shooting digital medium format. The GFX 50R is a camera on my list for that purpose, but I'm curious what your feelings are about medium format photography and why it grabs us so much. It's aspect ratio, it's fall off, and it's quality. The aspect ratio is slightly different, especially when you're shooting something like 6.6 or 6.9, and the fall off on those lenses is remarkable, it's beautiful, and the quality of the prints. Um, Kevin Fickling, who's a Fuji-sponsored photographer, had some prints at the Palm Springs Festival a couple years ago from that camera and was passing them around. And I was both mortified and blown away. Mortified because it was the print quality was so much higher than the X-T2 that I'm still using, which is, I don't necessarily need a print that size, but I was blown away. The, the GFX 50R is a camera that I would, I would take all day, all day long um, I'm just never going to spend that kind of money on a camera right now. I've got too many other irons to, you know, fish to fry, irons in the fire. But I would say go for it. Okay, keep moving here. Question whatever, 12, 13, uh, if I can find my way back. I actually would be interested in hearing your thoughts on 35mm Tri-X, especially how much you're okay to push it. So you can push Tri-X up to 3200, but I don't recommend it. I wouldn't really go with Tri-X above about 800. Uh, 640 even. You could go to 1600. There's a lot of ways around this. You could do stand development. You could do low temp development with no agitation. There's a lot of ways of bringing it down. Tr the problem with Tri-X when you go anything anywhere above like a thousand pushing it is it gets really contrasty. And when you have T-Max 3200 sitting there waiting for you that you can shoot at 800 all the way up to 12,000, I would sort of go to that film. Now, I'm a grain lover. I love T-Max 3200. I'm not a big fan of the Ilford 3200. It's a great film. It just doesn't have enough grain for me. It's too fine grain. So Tri-X for me was, was 320 normally is how I shot it, and then 640 if I had to push it a little bit. Okay, I've been pondering whether to buy an iPad for sketching, photo editing, and journaling. How do you find your iPad for journaling? I don't use the iPad for journaling, or I don't, and I don't use my phone. I don't want to spend any more time than I already do in front of a screen. I spend hours and hours and hours, and there's nothing more life-sucking to me than sitting in front of a computer monitor all day long. It's awful. I can't believe I do it as much as I do, and I can't believe you do it as much as you do, all of us as a collective. We've got to get back outside into the tangible world, talk to one another, touch one another, when it's safe, obviously, and all within the bounds of the playing field, if you know what I mean. But I just mean that I don't want to spend any more time in front of that screen. So I don't want to use it for that. What I do use the iPad for, the Pro in particular, uh-oh, now I've done it, is I, I read about 80, 80 books a year and I take notes on the books. And I will, depending on the importance of the book, will print those out and tack them in my journal because I need to go back and reference them over a period of time around the time that I'm reading the book. So that's what I do. But I would, if you're going to journal, I would use a pen and a paper or pencil and paper. It's cheaper, easier, better. And over the long run, you toss it in a bin and a hundred years from now, it's still going to be there. Question number too many. Hi, Dan. I'd like to know how you do your research for documentary work and how you get in contact with locals before you arrive in a country. I just start reaching out. I'm not shy. I try to be as professional as possible, as courteous as possible. And I try to throw in a little bit of humor. And I just reach out and I have my elevator pitch about who I am and what I'm doing down. And it's concise and there's a little bit of humor in saying I'm on my way and I'm thinking of doing this project and I'm curious your thoughts or is there, do you have any ideas or suggestions or how do you feel about this as someone who's from that country? And it starts to build. Most of the best projects I've done, the people who have helped me do it, it's been one or two people maximum because you develop a relationship and a friendship with someone. And once you go back over and over and over again, that's basically all you need. It's very rare that I have a team of people or somebody helping me on a project. It would be great. Someone's coming down the road and they mean business. Let's see who it is. Sounds like a truck. UPS? No. Huh. Ah, Amerigas. Time for the old gas delivery. Okay, let's see here. Okay, this is from Andre. I'm interested in having your perspective in the process of publishing a photo book, particularly the pros and cons of self-publishing versus going with an established publisher. So Andre, that is a wonderful question. The problem is 
That is such a complex answer that I can't do it on a Q&A. That has to be its own separate film. Just the, the decision between self-pub and publisher covers about 20 different additional questions and subcategories that will be based on you, your talent, your notoriety, your network, your audience building, your marketing skills, your distribution skills, your networking skills. It is a complicated endeavor to put a, or to really put a book out into the world. There are smaller ways of doing that, and I am a huge fan of the smaller ways. I'm a huge fan of going alone. I'm a huge fan of pre-selling pre -selling your books, of building your own audience that's native to you, and doing a small run of books that you sell out and move on with your life. Just to give you one quick uh, pitfall I've seen in my adult life, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of photographers bury themselves financially in bad publishing deals and then lose two years of their life in the relationship. Not just the publishing cycle of getting the book out, but then the subsequent year of having to try to move books. And selling illustrated books has never been easy in the history of the world. And there's a, it's so complicated, my head is spinning with all the things that I can share with you, but I will at some point. Okay, this next question. At the beginning of Minamata, which is Gene Smith's project, by the way, Smith writes, the first word I would remove from the folklore of journalism is the word objective. And perhaps free, as in free press, should be second, the second word removed. What are your thoughts on this? There is no such thing really as pure objectivity, unless you're the Buddha, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but most of the time, we all are products of our environment, our family, our history, our politics. Uh, we get we get skewed in today's day and age with basically atomized disinformation on a global scale It would be nearly impossible to be objective when you're a photojournalist or you're a journalist in general That is what one, one of your goals is to try to remain that as much as possible in terms of media in the world today It's very very rare that you're not going to have corporate influence on reporting I've seen this firsthand over and over and over again by doing assignments for both big media outlets and small that were owned by big corporate entities that were controlling what the news was Who saw it what they got and it's it's at a scale that's alarming if you've never been inside of a big media organization and been in these meetings and watched what was delivered as the news based on a very small cobble of very wealthy individuals at positions of power inside the media, you might not know how skewed it really is. Uh, I'm a much, much bigger, a much bigger fan of print media as opposed to television. So that's one, one uh, place to go, I think, for better journalism is print over television. And also, uh, what are your thoughts? Is it possible for someone who wants to have their own dark room to be environmentally conscious? Not really. Certain chemicals are better than others. Certain brands are better. Sprint system chemistry out of the East Coast, their stuff is environmentally pretty solid. But I don't know how you are a photographer, especially a documentary photographer or a photojournalist, and call yourself an environmentalist. You can be concerned about the environment or interested in the environment, but the fact is if you're on an airplane every week, you're not an environmentalist really. You're, all of these, that camera, this computer, all the electronics have toxicity in them at their DNA level. The New York Times years ago wrote an article about the digital landfill and the toxicity from our constant regurgitation of, pro of, of objects and what it's doing to the, to the planet. Rare earth metals, etc. and the darkroom is horrible. Not only is it horrible for chemistry and disposal, but it's horrible for you, you as a human being because it's terrible for your body. Having said that, love the darkroom and don't let anyone tell you differently. I'll take a silver print over an inkjet print any day of the week. And these folks that tell you those values of those two things are the same. Oh yeah, an inkjet print, same values as silver print. They're out of their mind. They're doing that because they're trying to keep the industry afloat. So I get it, but I don't believe it. Next question. Do you care what lens you use, vintage or modern, or does it uh, ease of use trump all? I don't really care. Some of my lenses, I guess you would call them vintage because I bought them when the cameras were relatively new. So that would mean, you know, 30, 40 years old. Uh, I guess that's vintage. And some of my modern lenses, I just ordered a 16 to 80 Fuji yesterday, so I don't really care. It's about the result for me is the only thing that matters. Okay, we're getting close here. Your thoughts on taking the moment in and enjoying it versus photographing the moment and not really being there. Okay, whoever said this, Q3DM172, this is the best question because I just had this thought in my head two weeks ago trying to make a film in 24 hours and I had two motion cameras, two still cameras, my wife had a still camera, I had an audio recorder, and I had my drone, and I was writing a script. And I was like, I'm here in the mountains, 
but I'm not actually here in the mountains. I'm trying to make a film and I can't do two things at once. There was no moment where I just sat down and said, yeah, I think I'm gonna enjoy myself. I just was consumed with making content. And so you have to be able to turn that on and off. I dream of a post COVID world where I can take a still camera, preferably my Leica with a 50 and a bag of Tri-X and my journal and I can go and do an old school project like I used to do. I just got off the phone with a very famous photographer from Latin America who I've known for years and years and years. He's one of the most interesting people I've ever met in photography. And every conversation I've ever had with him has completely changed my life. And I thought, he asked me about me and what I was doing and how my life was going. And I said, you know, I don't get much time for photography anymore. And I took for granted what I was doing when I met you during that era of my life where I had two Leicas in a bag of Tri-X and I didn't have a job. I was freelancing and I had time and I could say, I'm gonna go here for a month and go do a project and I would. And I had no cell phone, I had no laptop. There was no tether, no umbilical cord back to the world. I just went and did the project. I dream about those days. So hopefully at some point I'll be there. All right, we gotta keep going here, people. Wow, it's been 30 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna do one more or two more. Hey Dan, I've enjoyed your previous videos or rants regarding film. I always love it when people say I'm ranting. Because to me, this isn't even remotely close to a rant. You should ask my wife what a rant is. She'll tell you. She'll have a look of terror on her face, but she'll tell you. My wife is awesome, by the way. I mean, awesome. Like, she's the only reason I can do any of this stuff. She's hilarious too. And I jump out and scare her at least once or twice a day. She falls for it every single time. I've enjoyed the previous videos regarding film and what a lot of the popular YouTubers seem to miss when it comes to accurately sharing information about shooting film with regard to video topics such as how to shoot film as cheaply as possible or how to get started shooting film. Which things do you think these YouTubers completely miss but are much more important than the typical recommendations that all, they all seem to recycle? Also, how do you personally define the different genres of many newcomers when they think about things like documentary, street photojournalism? All right, so two questions. In terms of what the YouTubers are missing, <clears throat> I don't think they're missing anything. I think film YouTube hipsters, and I'm gonna put those three uh, people together, they're not hurting anybody, I've mentioned this before. They're helping to keep film alive, which is a great thing. And I don't think they're missing anything. I think they're choosing to highlight what will build following. That's it, that's what YouTubers are about 100%. The people who've committed heavy to YouTube are about one thing, or really anyone who's committed to social media. It's about building following. And so when you make that decision, you've thrown all your ethics and morals and standards out the window because the general population, how do I put this politely? They're not refined. They're looking for fast food. And so you give them fast food and you'll build your following up. I mean, to me, the idea of film is, who cares? I love film, I really do. But the fact is, you cannot hide from your contact sheets. If any of these folks gave me a contact sheet, in 30 seconds, I can tell you what level of photography they're at. And I can tell you if they're going up or they're going down, because you cannot hide from your negatives or your contact sheets. That's a very interesting story to me. There are half a dozen photographers here in town that I would love to go out to and say, let me see your contact sheets. You know what they would do? If, if of course they had access to them and we weren't in COVID times, they'd be like, here they are. Because they know how good they are. They know what they have. And they know that I could look at their contact sheets and be blown away and say, wow, yes, these are the three that were chosen in the story that all, the, that all of us know about. But look at what else was on those contact sheets. Look at Robert Frank's American's contact sheets and what was not printed in the exhibition. Something like 72,000 photographs and they chose 51 or something for the book. And what was not in the book is remarkable. I mean, the guy had a ton of stuff that was not in the book. So uh, I don't think YouTubers are missing. I think they're making decisions based on building following which I get, because that's what the only thing that YouTube is about, really, except if you want to learn how to, like, unclog a toilet at four in the morning with a, you know, uh, I don't know, you don't have a toilet plunger, you have, like, your kid's bicycle seat, and you're like, how do I do this? Somebody on YouTube has figured it out, and that film is there for you, for your salvation. Okay, in terms of naming genres and newcomers, I don't think it matters, but the difference to me between photojournalism and documentary is journalism, anything pertaining to journalism has a news angle and a time element. Whereas a documentary photographer can work from years and no one even knows they're out there. For example, you could take Jim Nachtway, who's arguably the single most important photojournalist of the modern era. Take Jim Nachtway's work from Afghanistan 
and take Ed Grosda's work from Afghanistan. Ed Grosda did two books. He did Afghanistan 80 to 89, and he did Afghan Diary 90 to 99 or something. He was the last photographer in the country, and the Taliban was already there, and they were allowing him to shoot. It's a remarkable story. Ed's a remarkable dude. Very different styles of work. Nakhtwe would go in and out. He was probably on assignment for time, and he was doing more journalistic frontline stuff, and then all of a sudden, Grazda's there for years, and he's not maybe doing an assignment here and there, but he's really thinking about long-term projects, books, Etc. Um, there's a lot of examples, and and by the way, those guys both cross over. Nakhtwe does a lot of pretty remarkable documentary work as well. But to me, journalism has a time element, news angle. All right, I think we're gonna cap it there. I'm almost out of breath. My mouth is dry. I'm out of mate. The dog is barking. There's a gas truck over there. The sun's in my eyes. My hair's messed up. But I just want you to know, I went above and beyond. And all joking aside, these were great questions and I only had like 11 left, but um, great questions and I will try to get to the, the rest of these on another installment. I love answering questions. I not only love the questions, but I have a lot of really weird data stuck away in my head that I think is actually helpful for some of you. So keep them coming.